Good morning, friends. Welcome to Mount Calvary. I'm Pastor Will. So thankful to be with you today. We're in week two of our series called the Acts Alliance, and it's where 11 churches, Lutheran churches together, have joined together to say we're going to pray together, we're going to read God's word together, and we're going to do a series. And so we've been praying together as pastors and huddling over the last several weeks. Uh, We'll have our last gathering here on Thursday where the pastors gather together, uh, and we've been praying for this series, the time to share it with you. Uh, Today you'll get to see two of those churches, uh, Concordia and Kirkwood, uh, which is just down the road uh, from us here, and also Messiah on Grand. And so you'll get to see some of what's happening in each of those churches, uh, but excited to share that with you today, excited to be a part of that. One way we worship the Lord is through giving, uh, and we're doing that if you're in person with our offering basket in the back or online, uh, you can go to our Donate Online. Our our board of directors met a few weeks ago, and we noticed and recognized and had talked to one of our partner churches, All Nations, uh, which is in University City. They're doing a bike drive, and we know that they've gone through some challenges, and their people have gone through some challenges, and so it's an opportunity for you to give. Uh, For $200, we can uh, help donate a bike during that bike drive. The board of directors has committed to to $3,000, and their goal is to get to 50 bikes, which would be a total of $10,000. So whatever you want to do on top of your normal giving, if you have the capacity to give more and you want to do that, or if you're new to giving, this is a great way to come into it uh, to celebrate the provision that God's given to you and give in that way. Uh, Another great way, even though they're not one of the 11 churches, it's a church we've partnered with for a long time and a way for us to continue that partnership and celebrate how God uses churches to work together to be able to share the gospel in multiple areas, specifically as we talk today in Acts around St. Louis. So we begin today with our invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word church can evoke feelings of frustration, bitterness, anger, and boredom. We are at times a crazy, diverse, and peculiar community. We are also sinful, hypocritical, lazy, vain, and exclusionary. We acknowledge at times when we, the church, have abused the mercy won by the Savior whose name we bear. We often use our hands to meddle in the selfish actions. Lord, take our hands and teach them how to serve. We often use our feet to walk the paths we should not walk. Lord, take our feet and show them where to go. We often use our minds for schemes of our own ambition. Lord, take our minds and send them. We often use our lips as weapons of war. Lord, take our lips and let them speak of war. Almighty God, in his mercy, has called, uh, his, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Jesus, we're in week two of this moment where we pray together with churches. We read today a passage that often we treasure. We get excited about in Acts 47. We see the wonderful works you did and the excitement it was to bring so many to you. And yet, Lord, sometimes we don't recognize that that meant that multiple places and multiple people and all different differences were working together and they were breaking bread together, and they were praying to you, and they were reading your word. And so we ask you to bring us back to that. Bring us back with these 11 churches who are praying together, who are reading your word, Lord, that you would create all kinds of revival in St. Louis, and that as churches, we'd be able to reach out to the broken. We'd be able to share your message, that you came to die and rise again, so the broken can be with you forever, so that we can have that relationship with you into eternal life. We ask all this in your name. Amen. Be seated. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Oh. 
comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, and distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. That is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please stand. The Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, the second chapter. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. 
And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. This is the gospel of the Lord. One word aptly describes the heart of Messiah Lutheran Church, community. Located on Grand Avenue in South St. Louis City, Messiah has been an active member of the surrounding Tower Grove community for the past 113 years. Venture through the doors of their beautiful church building and you'll find a community-focused congregation that cares about its neighbors. Throughout the week, Messiah welcomes students from Eagle Tower Grove East through their doors to hear about Jesus at the Ark, the Ark being a Christian after-school program. But these aren't the only doors that Messiah is opening in the community. In partnership with several other local organizations, Messiah has renovated 12 apartment buildings in Tower Grove East and Fox Park in order to provide affordable housing in their neighborhood. And these neighbors become family often over meals, at potlucks and Oktoberfest, tea parties and pizza on Wednesday night. And it's all rooted in a deep desire to share life together through the love of Christ. We are actually truly, genuinely engaged with the people who live in the community around the church building. One of the things that um, I notice is all the different people who get to share their gifts and their talents. Just like I am kind of a work in progress, so is the church. The church it modeled that for me. Never at any point did I feel like, um, as a, a community here, that anyone was saying we are perfect. Our pastors are just so consistent in always reminding us that we need a Savior and telling us that we have a Savior, that His name is Jesus, what He did for us. I mean, they always, always, they give us that assurance. In 1853, the first planned residential suburb west of the Mississippi was established, and not long after, Concordia Lutheran Church was planted. Years later, Kirkwood continues to be a thriving suburb, yet, while legacy and tradition are part of Concordia's story, neither have hindered this vibrant congregation that prides itself on trying new things. In addition to a reputation for excellence in music, Concordia is also known for intentionally serving a variety of populations throughout the community. From their night to shine prom for people with various abilities, to the annual turkey blessing, where this year a thousand turkey dinners were distributed to local families for Thanksgiving. While 2020 offered its share of challenges, last year Concordia Kirkwood celebrated the arrival of their new senior pastor, Pastor Steve Bongard. Before we even moved here, we were invited into a small group, so that has been a nice thing to have made some connections with people already, just on a kind of a personal Bible study level, and to know that people are praying personally for us. It's like family, you know, it's, it's just, it's what it is. You just, 
you have the camaraderie of the people that are here, you know, and you get to know them. And All the friendships that you make. and They help you and you help them and, you know, and it, it's Support. Just, yeah, it's, it's just a, it's a big family. For me, it's a lot about accessibility and welcoming. There's something about physical accessibility of Concordia that is just so welcoming and so amazing. One of my favorite memories is from youth group um, in high school. We did the amazing grace race uh, for our senior retreat, and I was just part of the group. It's just amazing to see how the church has grown together and continues to stay together because we really are one community just serving under his eyes. Concordia is ready to emerge into our next phase of ministry. God is stirring greatly at Concordia. Uh, and we're going to find ways to not only continue to do some of the things well that we've done really well, but to really venture out outside the four walls of Concordia and discover what it means to uh, reach out in our community in ways that we perhaps haven't before. How amazing it is, Lord, the way you provide and take care of your church. You loved your church so much that you died for your church. And yet we know the reason you had to die is because we have broken people who walk into our churches. They struggle. They have their own ideas of what church should look like, and it can get in the way, Lord. Today, as we read a passage that's so exciting, like Acts 42 to 47, we see how you brought so many to you. And we want that to return, Lord. We, we pray about that. We think about that, Lord. Help us to see how we get in the way. In Jesus' name, amen. When we see videos like today, when we read readings like today, we see the excitement, we feel the excitement. And I could leave us just in that midst of that excitement, but then the same question that is always there of what gets in the way? What distracts us, what derails us, all these different things that happen to us, how does that start? And so we think back to our history. When I was born in Macomb, Illinois, I grew up hearing stories about my aunt and my uncle when they lived with me because they didn't yet know what their future looked like. They would tell me stories of the games they played with me and all the different things that happened to me. I was baptized in that city, and yet I barely remember it. I don't really have a lot of memories about it, I have more memories about Travoli and Farmington, where I lived before I turned six. I have memories about Ottawa and Geneseo, where my family, where my grandpas were pastors and going to visit them all the time. But I don't have a ton of memories of Macomb. More of my memories of Illinois relate to Chicago, a school and a college and a university that I chose because of the memories of going to visit my cousins there. But if you were to compare Chicago to Macomb, you would guess that they're much different. Macomb is a small little town, a town that I visited a few times to see my Aunt Karina and Uncle Brian. And my Uncle Brian was one of those people that just had that amazing small town feel, that amazing care. He grew up with his family business of the heating and cooling business, and I loved going and seeing him and listening to his stories of that little town and learning about the place that I was born and baptized. One of the benefits of being a pastor was that God moved me around a lot. And while I grew up or had uh, some of those years, my early years in a small town, and then moved to a, a suburban area that was growing and expanding all the time, I learned to fall in love with different areas. He took me to places like California and Chattanooga, Tennessee, and spent a lot of time here now in St. Louis. And one of the amazing things that I've learned along the way is how to fall in love with the community, how to fall in love with the people that God has put around you in that time. And it's important to ask that question, how do we see the people in our community? How do we fall in love with them? I can honestly say I'm in love with St. Louis, I've fallen in love with Brentwood, and I've fallen in love with Rock Hill, and I say that with all sincerity and honesty. So then, 
if that's the case, if those there's moments where we begin to fall in love with our neighbors around us and the people around us, then what derails us from those summit seasons? What distracts us? What pulls us away? What, what causes us not to be able to see the acts around St. Louis? Because in this reading that we're about to read, you see and hear all the exciting things that are happening in this summit season. But what pulls us away from seeing what God is doing? I'm going to read it again for you, and then we'll dive into that. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, and to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders, and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord God added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Can you feel it? It's that moment in your life where you, where you remember everything and it was picture perfect. For mine, that moment was on my wedding day. I remember all the people that gathered, having over 300 people there that day for us to gather and celebrate it. I had prayed a long time and prepared myself for ministry and marriage, and there it was. God gave me the perfect fit. And on that wedding day, so many people gathered. Even people come up to us today and say to us, hey, do you remember that I was at your wedding? And sometimes many I go, uh, was that person at our wedding? Now, don't tell my father-in-law that, who had to pay for all those people that we can't remember who was there. But it was a beautiful, wonderful, amazing day. And in those summit seasons, we can get so caught up into all the wonderful things that we could go, what possibly could go wrong? I had strong assumptions that two Midwest kids could get married and move to California and everything would go perfectly. That there would be no bumps in the roads, and I was so optimistic to figure that we would figure it out today. And so today, when we look at a reading like this, when we look at a moment like this, where we see all of these churches gathering together, what's behind the scenes? What are the valleys that we're missing? What are the moments that we're not seeing as all these churches and all these people gather together? What are the concerns that lie behind Acts 2 that we can't see. Over the next three weeks, we'll see how Paul travels to three different cities. We'll talk about those cities and how they compare to the to the areas around St. Louis and how some of our stereotypes have been brought into our thoughts about those places and caused us to not fall in love with that. And we'll see all those different things that Paul walks through as even in the midst of the summit season where they're breaking bread, doing communion, we'll see that it wasn't perfect. There were still sinful people trying to pull them away, trying to distract and derail them from the moment that God was having them of the gospel being shared and being passed to so many. And we'll see that as exciting as this is for the Acts, the Acts Alliance, for us to join together with 11 churches, that there'll be things that will try to distract us. And so in order for us to come together, we have to ask, what are those things that are distracting us? And what is the distraction that is timeless for churches? Pastor Scott Jonas, one of the 11 churches from Glendale, says this, we are all trying to recreate our childhood church. Now, you may not think that that was timeless for them. How could the church in Acts be having issues with their childhood church? But just stop for a minute and think about it. That these now Christians who've fallen in love with Jesus, who have seen his wonderful works and ways, who want to share that with the whole world, grew up as Jewish boys and girls. They had traditions and things that they had their whole life, and now all of a sudden it was switching. They grew up together and played together and lived in those traditions and they were, there's the synagogue, the temple, the church, all those things were changing and it didn't feel good. Scripture doesn't have a lot of moments for us to be able to look into childhood lives, 
but it has one, specifically with our Savior. And so for a minute to capture just that childhood church, let's look back into young Jesus' life. Luke 2, 41 to 48 says this, Now his parents were went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but they were supposing him to be in the group. They went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at the understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Even Mary gets a little distracted with what's supposed to happen, with the traditions that are supposed to happen, and expecting that Jesus will follow along with that. Even Mary gets caught up in staying with the group, son. Here's what we do at Passover. Here's how we do now. Then we head back home. We make our journey here. Then we go there. Even Mary gets distracted a little bit with those traditions. Our childhood church is distracting us from seeing the acts around us. What did that mean for them? That meant for them that they were used to a tradition that's explained even in the reading here with Jesus of the Passover. They were used to that tradition. They were used to the journey they would make, the celebration they would make, the remembrances they would do, all the things that would remind them of the wonderful acts that God did for them as they came out of Egypt. And now the church was celebrating this supper on a regular basis. They were breaking bread. There's questions about what kind of breaking bread but some believe that it was communion. It was the Lord's Supper. It was what Jesus had taught them. And here, to take a meal that they had celebrated once a year that was special to them, a tradition they had had since they were children, and change it to be regular, and maybe even every week, and, and so often, how could that possibly be? Even as exciting as it was, there was something behind it that they were fighting inside of them to ask that question. It seems odd, but they were used to scrolls. They were used to being read God's word on scrolls. And now there was something new called the codex, which would later be more like what we know as a book. And they were reading out of these. They didn't like that. It didn't feel right. It didn't look the same. It wasn't what they were used to when they came to the temple and the synagogue. And they saw church. This is now what we see and potentially was happening right here in Acts 2. Is that all these amazing things are happening. This is changing. And there's people behind the scenes who are questioning it. And finally, just because Jesus rose from the dead, now we believe in a bodily resurrection. We were waiting for Messiah. We were waiting for the promised land to happen, a, eternal life, some kind of promise to be there. But this bodily resurrection, now this is what we're preaching. This is what we're teaching. This is not really what we had heard before. Jesus ch changed everything. And it's even as odd as that is for us because we know all the truths that we now see today in the church. We see what books mean for us. We see what it means for us to celebrate the Lord's Supper weekly. And we know all of how those wonderful things are, and especially the bodily resurrection, that God can change people who are sinful human beings and restore them, and through his death and resurrection, that our bodies will rise again to be with him forever is a wonderful thing. There were people battling it because of their childhood churches. They were battling all those things. And so even today, though, what, while we can be celebrating all these amazing acts of the church, we can be like them. We can get struggle with the past of our churches of the past and wonder why isn't it like that. We can wonder what was happening and, and why the church has to change today. And here's the fact. Your childhood church, my childhood church, was not perfect. And this fact that we're sharing today, that different churches, different pastors, and people reach different communities. And so for us to see the valley, the challenge that we have, as exciting as Acts 2 can be, we must recognize how our own history, our own past plays a part, 
and us being blinded by the acts around us and what God is doing. Brandon O'Brien, from the book I've been talking about, not from around here, and shared a little piece of last week, talks about growing up in a moral community in Arkansas. He talks about what a moral community meant. It meant the church was highly important, and they attended it several times a week, and they all valued that, and many people valued church. You were actually an outsider if you didn't think that church was important. And so in the moral community, they felt this responsibility to make sure that nothing infiltrated them from the outside world. They were concerned about big cities and politics and all sorts of things that could wreck the morality that they were trying to teach and preach and share with one another. They went so far to, being, to do some of those haunted houses. You may have heard about them before, those haunted houses where they would set up and there would be a drunk driver accident and then they would walk the kids through this pretend hell, scaring them about all the horrible things that could happen if they didn't listen to Jesus, if they didn't follow Jesus, if they committed all of this immoral things and didn't listen to what the Bible taught. And that's what Brandon grew up in. That's what his childhood taught him. And that's how his childhood impacted him going forward as he thought about what the church should be and what it should look like. In the book, he goes through lots of moments to be able to to change himself, to, to see, to learn what God can do in different communities and different places and how he can do different acts, even in places like New York and suburbia, not just the small town he grew up in. He sees how both places stereotype one another and they challenge one another and their past impacts what they can see God doing today in the communities around them and how he can use them with their new unique gifts to live that out. I tell you the story of my childhood, not because it was the time where I grew up the most. I grew up the most in suburbia, but that moral community was a constant war that was being waged and raged in my house and they were going back and forth in that war because they were battling the moral community that they grew up in that my parents grew up in in the small towns that they lived in and the suburbia we now lived and there was something in me that said somehow we can figure out how to navigate through this world even in suburbia even in big cities and we can reach hurting people and you see that's the thing that is always true The truth is there are hurting people in every community. And if we're so caught up with the valleys of our past, of of what has to change, or how do we reach these hurting people, or, or are we being infiltrated by this immorality of the world around us, we can miss the opportunities to see the hurting people. So Acts 2, 42 to 47 immediately changes into this moment where Peter and John are going to the temple. They're following the traditions. They're still in that moment before the Jews and the Christians separate and they're kicked out of the temples and the synagogues because they get tired of the teachings that are now changing and they're still in that great moment where they're trying to play nice together even though they're getting frustrated how they're changing the church, what they're preaching and teaching. They're still doing things together. And in those moments, Peter and John do this. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at that hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man, lame from birth, was carried. When they laid daily, who laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask for alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at them, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something, something from them, but Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered into the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Peter and John were going to that temple to pray. And they were living in that summit season. And they were not immune to the valleys that were in the world. And immediately they noticed this hurting, broken, lame 
man. They had for not forgotten what Jesus had taught them, that he was there for hurting people. He had come for the broken, the lost, the sinful. He had come to be with them. Concordia, in their local neighborhood, or Messiah, in their local neighborhood, recognizes that they needed a charter school, and they worked together to figure out all of those things of the ways that kids could go to a school and be taught in that way. They also figured out how to do after school programs and, and provide for those families. And during this time of the wilderness season, those families needed more support and more help as they continued to work hourly jobs and jobs like that where sometimes they fluctuated up and down and Messiahs continued to ask how can they do that. Concordia and Kirkwood, a completely different environment not quite suburbia, not quite mid-county. We don't know really how to define what that is, but they noticed this. There were plenty of people who were hurting. There were people that were locked down. There were people that were nervous with all the things going on and the virus and the pandemic, and so they did care and share baskets. They intended them for their young at heart, but they found out that soon there were so many people who were giving these care and share baskets to everyone. They looked for the opportunity to live out the acts for the hurting people. There are hurting people in every community, and at all times, we as a church can walk right past hurting people. I just started a new podcast that is called The Confessional, and it talks about hurting people. It has hurting people tell their stories about things and moments they've been carrying with their whole life. And we can see that there are hurting people all around us. Sometimes the church gets so used to living things out in a certain pattern, in a certain way, and sometimes replicating one another instead of just asking the question that even though I grew up in a city and a place like this, and there were hurting people that looked like this, who are the hurting people in my community right now? But let me not miss that Jesus knows how you are hurting right now. He knows that you come here weekly and are here this morning because of that very fact that you need him. There is brokenness in your life. There are moments and places where you are struggling and wondering and asking Jesus where to go next. Even in our summit seasons, even, even in our best moments, we are battling sin. And we'll do anything to hide it. We'll do anything to put it away until the moment where we have to come face to face with it. And Jesus has gifted churches and pastors to look into the communities they live in. To seek out the hurting people with all of their tricks to hide it. And to, to help them as they look into their lives, as they need to confess and admit all the challenges they are facing. The remnants, the, the moments of my moral community, make this as a season where it can sometimes be something that I am afraid of. Jesus can see all of what I'm doing. He can see all of my mistakes. He can see everything that I do. And I used to live in such a great fear about that. I used to worry about that. But there is a powerful gospel message that Jesus knows how you and I are hurting right now, and he died for that. He knows how our community is hurting right now. He knows who the hurting people are in our community, and there is a wonderful hope about that. A hope that no matter how hard the hurting people are trying to hide it, we know that they need Jesus, that the person who can restore and transform their life is, a, is Jesus who died and rose again from the dead and wanted their life to be brought back to their creator, to be given to them the eternal life where there would be no more pain, no more suffering, where their sins would be forgiven. He knows the brokenness that's in our community. And the blessing for us is he can point us as a church to see it as people to see it, as 11 churches to see in each of their communities what struggles are going on. And Jesus came for that, and then he gave the Holy Spirit to walk with us, to give us those eyes to see who's hurting and how to help. No matter what you're hiding, Jesus died for that. 
He knows about your addictions, your habitual sins, and he knows about the pains of the world. He knows how angry you are about cancer and our country, and that is why he died for the church. And that's why he gave up his life so that you could come out of hiding and be free from all of that. And there are those summit seasons when you can't get enough of Jesus. There are the moments where we just crave Jesus so much. We just come and seek out and are just in his word. We immerse ourselves in our word. And that is the moment that Acts 2 is teaching us all about. They devoted themselves to Jesus' teaching, supper, and prayer. They just couldn't get enough of it. They just kept coming back because all the hurting in the world, they were seeing an answer to it. They were seeing all those pains and struggles they had hid from away from for years, and they were seeing that Jesus was answering and responding to that, and he died for that, and it was this amazing moment, and they wanted to share that with everyone who was hurting, everyone that possibly was trying to hide in all different corners. They wanted to do that, and that is where the 3,000 came. That is where the people came together. That is the moment where people just wanted to hear more because they were so excited, so enthused about it. And that's the commitment of the Acts, of Lion, Acts Alliance. It was simple. Those 11 churches said simply this, we're going to commit ourselves to prayer and reading God's word and listening to one another, and that's it. And then we'll see what the Lord is going to do. And that's where the next part of Acts comes. 43 to 45, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their positions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as they had need. Two weeks ago, I sat in the room for the second time with pastors, standing in front of them as we tried to begin our discussion on sharing what God is doing that's special in your church, different in your church? What's he doing in your community? And sometimes, even though pastors can talk a lot, it takes a moment to get them going and to get them sharing, but soon the stories came out, and the moments came out, and some said, we're just in a season of prayer. We're just praying that Jesus would show us how to reach our community. Some talked about that finally young families are coming to our church, and we're so excited that young families are coming to our church. And some, some said that, that they were excited about baptisms that were happening in our ch their church. And for the first time, they've been able to reach some of these families that they hadn't talked to before. And baptisms were happening. And they were so excited about it. And the spirit of competition went away, and the spirit of collaboration came in. And it was this amazing summit moment as I listened to them, and I heard it, and I had watched in many different ways, competition in our churches, and I was excited to see collaboration. I was thrilled to see us not worrying about what this person was going to think and whether they had already been through that season of young families coming or, or a lot of baptisms happening or a season of prayer, but they were just excited to pray for that church in that season and in that moment, and we were finding common ground. We were finding ways to talk about what we were going through and sharing with, with one another. And soon I believe that partnering will happen and we'll see how to help one another. Intentional relationships create awareness and opportunity. It's a value of ours at Mount Calvary that we value intentional relationships. It means being in the lives of people and being intentional with them allows us the opportunity to see in their lives, see their hurting, broken moments, see the moments that we're with them. And like are these churches, to be excited with them in great seasons of this and to walk with them in brokenness and praying for them. And these are the times that we together can see the acts in our community, as we come together and we celebrate with one another and we see the acts around St. Louis, we see what God is doing in each church and no longer do we have a spirit of competition. We've put away our childhood churches, we've put away the way that we're trying to replicate what we've had before or replicate it with one another and say, you should do this like our church has done this, and we are pulling back from all of that and just being in awe of what Jesus is doing in each community. 
And that has been our prayer together as 11 churches, that we would just help one another, we would walk alongside one another, and we would be in that moment like in Acts 2 of awe of the wonders that God is doing as we see broken people coming to Jesus, as we see people who are battling sins in their lives, who are struggling with the world, come to know a Savior that would walk perfectly for them, who died and rose again so he could be with them forever. Let's pray. Jesus, we know our childhood churches hold us back from seeing what the church is today. Help us, Jesus, to see the hurting in our community. Help us to join together as churches and people to care for our community together. And when we are hurting, Lord, bring your church to speak your powerful word of love and forgiveness in our lives. Jesus, bring more people to our churches so we can share your teaching, supper, and prayer. Amen. We speak together the words of our faith in the Apostles' Creed. We turn to God in a time of prayer. Lord, we thank you for a wonderful preschool year. We thank you for teachers and church staff working together as we were able to care for so many families. We're thankful for wonderful picnics and celebrations as kids move on to, to kindergarten, Lord, and all that's there. We're thankful for Carol Dahlman and her faithful service and so many that were there to celebrate her at the picnic and, and as we were able to celebrate her as a staff, Lord, the wonderful work that you've given this extraordinary servant to be able to do to care for so many families. We won't even know all the stories, but we're thankful for the way that you shaped and formed Carol to care for the hurting families, kids, to love them each day. Lord, we pray for the Acts Alliance. We pray as these churches commit to praying together, to reading your word together as the pastors do and as the churches do through these next five weeks, Lord, that you would be with each of us, that we would just be able to see the acts that are happening around St. Louis. We pray for Concordia Kirkwood right now as they are in a new season with a new pastor who's trying to and praying about all the things that, that, that you would have them do in Kirkwood. Lord, open their eyes and guide and lead Pastor Steve and his team as they see the new steps with this new amazing building that you've gifted them with, Lord, and let us as Mount Calvary celebrate that. But we're thankful for Messiah and, and Pastor Steve Miller who's there. The wonderful gifts that you've given him and uh, and to walk with him, Lord, as he goes through this time to, to consider all the ways that they can support their community around them. Lord, we're thankful for, for his heart and the way that he loves uh, that area. He loves th that part of the city of St. Louis, and he cares for so many, Lord. Guide and direct him and the Church of Messiah to continue to reach their community. Lord, and we celebrate our provision. We celebrate the ways that you provide for each one of these churches, each one of us as individuals, Lord and the ways that you care for us every single day. We lift up these petitions. We pray for the Mockle family for justice, peace, and healing. Lord, we lift up Forrest and his balance issues. We pray for Francis, who needs a new kidney. Lord, we lift up these people with health issues for Bill and Leslie and Tom, for Linda and Jason, Susan, Bonnie, Debbie, Ann and Steve, Monica, and Marissa. And we lift up Jeff with personal struggles. But we continue to see the challenges of cancer, and we know that you're the ultimate healer, and so many are going through it. And we lift up these names for Tim and Joanne, Maxine, Julie, Nancy, Ron, Reed, Dawn, Vince, Pat, Linda, Jerry, Mike, Russell, Sheila, Colleen, and Mary Lynn. We pray for those that are mourning the loss of loved ones that you would Help them to know the hope and certainty we have of eternal life because of your death and resurrection and what 
that bodily resurrection means, Lord, the, the promise of restoration and, and the gift that you give to us to be with you forever. We pray for healing of our country's division, a cure for the virus, our city, our nation, our leaders, Lord, our community, our schools and seminaries and teachers. Give them rest this summer as they have readiness to come back into the new school year next year. Pray for medical personnel and first responders as they still care for so many that are hurting, that have needs, Lord. We pray for the homeless, who are, uh, the poverty and the mental illness they face and the people who care for them. We pray for those that are concerned for their future employment. They may be uh, afraid or feel shame to share that, Lord, but we pray that they would open up and you would give us direction on how to help and support them as they go through that season of their life. And Lord, help us to love our neighbors. Help us to see into our community, to fall in love with our community so that we can do your acts in this area. And we pray together the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Maybe seated. A couple different announcements. Uh, the church will have different times and times that we go in and out as the preschool isn't here. Uh, so there's always ways to be able to text uh, Tracy and I in that moment. And we take the holiday seasons like tomorrow uh, to take rest and uh, continue to, to move on to this. We'll also look for the opportunities as we do vacation. Um, Prayers for Peace meets this Wednesday, uh, June 2nd at 1 p.m. Uh, there's the prayer breakfast coming up this Saturday, June 5th at 9 a.m. We thank you today for Tom Koenig, uh, who's, uh, who was here today, uh, and the wonderful work he did to serve in that. Uh, I've played music for us since Jill is on vacation. Uh, we uh, are, as I mentioned, also with our bikes, the opportunity to be able to give in that, and with All Nations and the bike drive, and so if you, that's something that moves in your heart, it's $200 for that bike and the helmet to take care of that. Uh, our congregational meeting is June 27th, and so uh, June 27th we'll have a congregational meeting. We'll talk about some of our future. We'll talk about coming out of the wilderness, what are the things that we're doing, and all of that uh, for the opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, last thing uh, is to, if this is a message that connected with you, uh, a one way that you can reach out to hurting people is to share it on Facebook, and so if that's something that you feel moved today to do that. And finally, we celebrate God with our, our gifts and offerings uh, in the wonderful ways that he provides for us every single day. With that being said, please receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Ordinary people. Now go be one. <laughs>